Welcome, everyone. Am I on? Can you hear me now? Good. Well, I thought uh, Tish did a really nice job last week kicking off our new message series. Uh, kudos to her for being willing to share from her own experience and being vulnerable that way and for challenging us to have the courage to hope, right? Uh, and her message was a great way to kick off the series because hope is connected to beauty. And that's what we're calling the series, Beautiful. This is a picture of some spring growth. It represents the series well because uh, we've been through a very long winter, haven't we? And I don't just mean that literally. Uh, it's almost like that we've been through this year-plus long, uh, dark, gray, cold uh, winter of the soul, right? So as we were praying about this new message series and just, you know, asking God, what, what do we talk about? He, he actually gave us this word, beautiful, um, and actually gave us the word beautiful for the year, we believe. We felt like he was saying, I'm going to bring beauty from these ashes. Um, and uh, this message series, is the, the messages within this series are going to be focused on uh, being aware of God's beauty. Because that's, that's oftentimes the issue, isn't it? It's awareness. You know, we see what we focus on. Uh, we experience what, what we can perceive, right? So on that note, I want to introduce this week's topic. You guys have all heard the saying, um, believe, uh, seeing is believing, right? Seeing is believing. We've all heard that. That's certainly true with a lot of things. But I want to, I want to focus on believing from the perspective of the kingdom, uh, and oftentimes, the things of the kingdom you can't see or perceive, right? So my title today, rather than seeing is believing, I'm calling it Believing is Seeing. And our text is from John chapter 20, if you want to turn there. We'll be in verses 24 through 29, uh, just to give you a little context of what we're going to read, because I, I, I want to read the whole thing, but... Um, this is right after the resurrection of Jesus, which is very fitting because we just celebrated that two weeks ago, right? But after Jesus rose, uh, he appeared to most of the disciples, except for Thomas wasn't there when he appeared. So what we're about to look at is an interaction between Thomas and the other disciples uh, after that event happened. Now, Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Lord, I just ask your Holy Spirit to be so present here today. Be present in our hearts, be present in our minds, and Lord, draw us into uh, the message of this story. Draw us by your Holy Spirit, God. We just say yes to the presence, the power, and the drawing of the Holy Spirit right now. If you agree with that, just say yes. yes. So, some things we tend to not believe unless we can see them, right? Right? For example, if someone that you didn't know came up to you and said, uh, hey, I'm going to give you a million dollars, almost certainly your response would be like, yeah, I, I'll believe that when I see it. And rightfully so. But ironically, sometimes people don't believe even after they see. 
so, or at least their, their actions don't reflect, even, they may profess belief, but they don't really believe. Like, think about the children of Israel. So the children of Israel saw the Red Sea part. They witnessed God in the form of a, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of, of fire, yet even after seeing God's presence and power, seeing God move, seeing the miracles in Egypt, seeing all that happen, they still made an idol and worshiped it instead of God. So side note, let's not be like that. Let's not experience the power and the presence of God and yet live like we don't believe. You know, whether we believe here or not, do we believe here? So some people believe or some people see and they still don't believe. Uh, but with certain things, and this is the, the main focus of the message today, with certain things, especially the things of the kingdom, we won't see them until we believe. We don't see them until we believe. But when we believe that way, uh, Jesus actually pronounced a blessing over that. He said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now contrast that with the way Thomas believed. Unless I see all this stuff with my own eyes, touch it with my own hands, I will not believe. Now, we can give him a little credit because at least once he, once he saw it, at least he believed then. That's the right response to seeing God move, right? At least then he believed and he said that Jesus was his Lord and God. Very significant statement. That's the right response to seeing. But there's a blessing pronounced over those who believe before they see. And here's the thing about our life with God. You all know this. Much, if not most, of the things that were promised and the things of the kingdom, we can't see yet. We can't experience them yet. It's called the not yet of the kingdom in theology. We can't yet experience heaven, except for in little glimpses when uh, his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. There are little glimpses of heaven here on earth. But life on earth is kind of fraught with uh, evil and suffering. In fact, we live behind enemy lines, don't we? The Bible calls the devil the prince of this world. He has dominion here. He's a ruler of this age. So at times we experience significant evil and suffering. If you want to know why, that's why. Satan is the prince of this world. So the question is, how do we experience the beauty of God in a world like this? And how does believing before we see help us with that? Well, the answer is it has everything to do with our perspective. So I want to talk a little bit about perspective. Uh, have you guys seen this meme on, on the internet? It says, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not true, not truth. So it's attributed to this guy named Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor. He was the last of the uh, Pax Romana emperors, which, you know, the time of peace and dominance. Uh, and he was a Stoic philosopher. He was thought to be really smart. Uh, and I get what he's trying to say, but he's wrong. He is absolutely wrong here. And there's one word that spoils both of those sentences, and it's the word everything. Because the truth is, some things are fact. Some opinions are fact. Some perspectives are true. So the word everything ruins those, those things. I mean, that picture, yeah, it's a, cool, it's a cool thought, but that's just an optical illusion. It's not reality, right? In reality, if, if two people were standing looking at some boards, 
In reality, there's either three boards or there's four boards. That is not a matter of opinion or perspective, right? And also, if it's true that everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact, then that statement is an opinion, not a fact. So this statement cancels itself out. It's not true. Uh, this one is similar. You know, a number can't be both a six and a nine. Uh, obviously, there is an issue of perspective, which, which way are you looking at it? But if this is a real number, then it has to have an assigned value to it. That can't be subjective. Otherwise, it's just a symbol that means whatever I want it to mean. And if it can mean anything, then it is completely useless for communicating anything, which is the purpose of that symbol, right? It's to communicate either this many fingers or this many fingers. If the meaning is subjective, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? So, I bring all of that up because, very simply, we have to understand and believe that truth is not uh, subjective. It's not a matter of perspective or opinion. Truth is truth. Now, knowing truth is the tricky part. You know, that's a whole different matter we can't get into right now, but... But there is such a thing as truth, and people can have knowledge of truth. Listen to me. This is so important. We can know truth. Sounds obvious, but you would be surprised. If you question people long enough, you'll expose that they don't actually believe that in our culture today. But Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. What happens if we can't know truth? We can't be free. You shall know the truth and it, and it will make you free. So I'm sure the intention of those misguided memes is simply to bring unity to people, which is a great cause. It's a, it's a great purpose. Um, but they're nonsensical. They cancel themselves out. And that's not even, in, even the part of, of, uh, of perspective that I want to focus on today. I just had to really make the point strongly that truth and knowledge exist and we can know truth. Now, for Thomas, his perspective was, I don't know truth unless I see it. Okay? He said, I, I, can't, I can't receive that as truth unless I can see it and touch it and and whatever, Jesus had a completely different view. He said, blessed are those that believe who, who it's their truth, even though they don't see it yet. Blessed are those. See, a beautiful life requires God's blessing. You cannot live a beautiful life if God isn't blessing you, if there's no blessing there. We're going to actually talk about blessing next week in depth, somewhat in depth. Um, but we should pay very close attention whenever Jesus says, blessed are those, dot, dot, dot. Right? That's definitely an important part of a beautiful life. Well, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So I was trying to think of a way to... Uh, make this more real to illustrate this point. And I thought, you know what? Our journey as a, as a church plant um, is a great example of the principles I'm trying to explain today. Uh, we started out with just a few people. Um, I was actually Johnny come lately. I, I really hesitated to believe. I was like, God, you, I mean, I was literally saying, God, you got to write it on the wall for me to do this. You know, because I, I know the statistics of the failures, church plant failures, you know, and I was just like, I don't want to be a statistic, you know. So I really, I really need to know it, you, it's you, God. But, but literally, once God spoke it very clearly to me, once I believed, 
I, I never turned back. So we started meeting in a house, uh, just a few of us, and then we grew and uh, went to a bigger house. Uh, and then after it became clear that you know, the whole house thing wasn't going to work for very long, uh, we began praying, and we really felt God say, there is a church out there that's going to let you meet there. Uh, and so we, we believed it. Before we saw it, we believed it. And two people from our team, God, God did a miracle based on our belief. It was Sean and Sida. They were on their way home once, and they just pulled into a, a church parking lot by their house, and there just happened to be the senior pastor and his wife uh, leaving the church at the time, or were they coming or going, whatever. Uh, they were out there, so Sean and Sida had a conversation with them. They explained our situation uh, the people from the other church explained their situation. There was literally just a few people left meeting in this big 17,000 square foot building. Uh, and Sean's like, man, you definitely got to talk to Greg and Susan. So two days later, Susan and I met with them. And literally that Sunday, we had a, a church building to meet in. And it was the perfect solution for the season that we were in. It was awesome. Uh, but as time went on, we were, how long were we there, you guys? Uh, two years, maybe, something like that. So we, we began to grow, our needs began to grow, and we began to go, this, this just isn't working that great anymore. So we prayed, and, and we felt God speak to us as a team. It's time to find your own place. So we believed, and again, God moved miraculously. And this time, it was in a different and extremely profound way. Um, actually, I was talking to a realtor on the phone, uh, just in faith, going, this is, we would like to lease a building. It needs to look like this. It needs to be in this geographical area, blah, blah, blah. Um, and as, as he was having a conversation with me, one of the other people in his office overheard him talking to me and came up to him and said, hey, you gotta, you gotta talk to this guy, Rick. He, he helps churches all the time. So the realtor set up this meeting with Susan, me, uh, Rick, and the realtor and his assistant. So <laughs> poor realtor and assistant, because really the whole meeting was just God. Uh, literally, by the end of the meeting, me, Susan, and Rick were in tears. It was such a powerful, God-inspired time. And many of you know Rick now. He comes here sometimes. He's part of another church, but he likes to drop in and, and attend a service once in a while. Um, but Rick has helped plant hundreds of churches all over the world, literally. Literally. At, at, at his own expense through his foundation that he has. Uh, so at the end of this meeting at that realtor's office, um, I said to him, so what, you know, what do we need to do to, to receive help from you? Is there some kind of application or vetting process? And he, and he just smiled and he went, yeah, we just did that. <laughs> so thanks to his incredible creativity, uh, his generosity, uh, we started looking for spaces to lease or even buy, which wasn't even an option before we met him. Um, but to make a long story even longer, uh, one day uh, we, Rick was taking us around looking at uh, several different buildings. Uh, this building was the last one scheduled to look at that day. So we weren't driving with Rick. We were meeting him over here. And I'll never forget this. We were just passing Cherry Hills Presbyterian, and God spoke to me, and he said, the one you're on the way to is, is your building. He said that. I told Susan, I told several of you, you know, I, this is the one. Um, and uh, when we got here, we walked in, and I could see it. I believed it before I physically saw it. I believed it so much I could see it. I remember walking into this room. Now there was like probably a dozen offices on the outside and in the center there was another dozen or so 
cubicles. So it was an office space. But I, I walked in and I went, there's the sanctuary. I literally went into the office that was in this corner and I said, this, the platform's gonna be right here. This is where the stage will be. Uh, you know, we, Susan and I talked about the cafe. We talked, it, it literally looks now how we envisioned it then. Amen. We saw it before it was reality. You see this? In fact, we saw it because we believed. That's what I mean by believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. Now, disclaimer, <laughs> you got to be really careful with this. It can go south very quickly. I'm not talking about some kind of new age visualization or something like that. I'm talking about hearing from God. But even that can be really tricky because oftentimes we mistake our desires for God's desires. So easy to do that. And can I just give you a real quick solution to that problem? Really easy. No God good enough to know his voice. Right? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. If you know God, you'll know his voice. And then always be careful to be aware of the deceitfulness of your own heart. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things. Above how many things? All of them. That's pretty dang deceitful. We should have a reverence and a fear of that, of our own hearts. And it also, it really helps to surround yourself with godly people who will confirm or challenge in appropriate times. But you know what? We had all of that. We had all of that. And thank God, because in the process of buying this building, we experienced many very significant challenges to what we thought God said. Uh, in fact, there were several times that we just went, yeah, in the natural, there is absolutely no way this is going to happen. It's impossible. I, I, I wish I had time to go into some of those, those stories, but I don't. But, but God responded miraculously. Oh, you have to have an elevator. What? It's impossible to put an ele elevator in this building because it's a garden level. Miracle. They gave us a pass on that, which they never do. The guy's searching through the book. For, anyway, I could go on and on and on, story after story after story of, of the impossible happening. But when we couldn't see a way forward, we believed God. We just believed him. We just went, if that was actually God speaking, and it's possible it wasn't, I'm a fallible human, but if it was God speaking, and I think it was, then he'll make a way. And he did over and over and over in miraculous ways. We didn't force it. We didn't like blow past common sense. Well, <laughs> I guess it depends on how you define that. We blew past common sense many times uh, in the world's view. But listen, we weren't fools. We weren't foolish. We were fools in the eyes of the world, but we were fools for Jesus. You know, we weren't fools. We were, we're, we were faithful. And here we are. <laughs> here we are in this renovate building. We have our own space. We own it. We can tear down walls. We can do whatever we want within reason. Praise God. I see, I, I tell that because... It highlights the key to a beautiful life. Please hear me. Take this seriously. This is so important. If you want a beautiful life, just know God. Know him enough to know what he wants for your life. Then do it. 
That's it. That's it. But again, since much of the kingdom is unseen, there will be many, many, many times when you're going to have to believe it before you see it. You're actually going to have to believe it so much that you do see it or you won't keep going. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's what faith is, you guys. Uh, in fact, what, what's faith if you already see what you're believing for? That's what hope is. What is hope if you are, you know, who hopes for what they already have? So God is inviting us into that beautiful life of faith. It's an invitation. Come, all you who are burdened and weary, come and I will give you rest. It's a beautiful life. It's beautiful because it gives us hope. And hope brings joy. And hope and joy are beautiful, right? Now, if we have a fear to hope, like Tish talks about last week, you know, if we're in fear, well, then we're going to miss out on that beauty. Faith is critical to the beauty. Trust, hope, it's all, it's all critical to a beautiful life. But when we do live in faith and hope and trust, then we can experience that beauty even in the middle of the ugliness of the world. It's not conditional. Why? Because it's based on what is unseen. And we can stay in that beauty even when things don't happen like we want them to. Even when disappointment comes, we go, I trust God. Elevator, no problem for God. <laughs> Listen, there's rest when we trust. It, it kind of lifts off all the pressure. And I have to say, Susan and I are experiencing this at deeper and deeper levels all the time. We have to spend a lot of time meditating on these biblical ideas. We're, we're experiencing them deeper and deeper and deeper. We're learning that we, we can't manage everything that happens in the world. You know, some people are so obsessed with the news and everything that's going on in the world right now. There's so many terrible things happening in the world right now. And you can glue yourself to them and carry them and be stressed and depressed about it and stuff like that. But you know what we feel God is saying? Stop trying to carry everything that you can't do anything about. Stop carrying things that you can't do anything about. He says, that's my responsibility. I'll take care of those things. Now, don't misunderstand me. If you have the power to do good, then by all means, do it. Focus on it. Put a lot of effort and work into it. If God tells you to. Because many times we involve ourselves with good causes that he's not calling us to, and even that will not go well. We have the same approach with renovate, even our own family. You know what I mean? We can't keep track of everybody's everything. We can't make ourselves the answer to all of that. That is the pastor's uh, burden. And that's often the expectations of a congregation. You should know everything about everything and you should solve it. Sorry, I'm not taking that on. No. Because even if I tried, we would, we would just be completely stressed out. We would be so overwhelmed that we wouldn't be any good to any of you. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. We deeply care. 
We know, I mean, I'm looking about this room and I know so many details about all of your lives. It's kind of ridiculous. Maybe not all of your lives, but many of you. I know a lot of detail about your life. I still carry all that. I still love you deeply. I still work my butt off to do everything I can to help. But just not in a way where I feel like I'm the solution. See the difference? I'm not the solution. God is the solution. See, that's what this passage is talking about. Do not be anxious about the news. Do not be anxious about the, the mass murders. Don't be anxious about your job. Don't be anxious about anything. But in most situations, wait, how many situations? Every situation. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with an attitude of thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Bring it to God. Then trust him with it. He's pretty good at what he does. And then you'll experience the beauty of peace in your life. So because of those principles, our priority over everything else in the world is to hear God's voice and to do what he says. That's what matters. That's why our morning prayer time is on the schedule. We guard it. It is an absolute priority in our lives because the key to a beautiful life is knowing God. So we have to protect that relationship, that time with him, that place where we go, oh yeah, I picked that burden up again. That's not mine. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Oh, okay, I'm free again. So important. Our main focus has to be bringing everything to Jesus, laying it at his feet, and then listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Walk in the Spirit. Keep step with the Spirit. Uh, be governed by the Spirit, not the flesh. All through the New Testament and even the Old, this principle remains true. Let's visit the, our series verse again in the context of what we're talking about. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So this is from Ecclesiastes 3. You probably are familiar with some of the famous uh, verses in Ecclesiastes 3. Songs have been written about it, different things. There's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant. There's a time to uproot. So there's 14 different pairs like that, uh, 14 different juxtapositions uh, in that section of scripture. And, and in this verse, verse 11, comes right after those. So what is he saying? He's saying after all those different seasons in your life, all the good things, all the births, all the deaths, he says, God has made all of them beautiful at the right time. All of them. He works all things together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. Everything is made beautiful in its time. So there's an element of time here, right? Sorry, I'm doing this time thing again. No, I'm not sorry. 
That's where we live, right? We live in, in space and time. But it also talks about eternity, doesn't it? Well, that's where God lives. God lives in eternity. So in time, we go through all the different seasons, right? Really difficult seasons, really good seasons. Now, attach all this to what we've been talking about. We see what we focus on. We see what we focus on. Now, we can't help but see the temporal things in time, right? They're in our face. We don't have to put any effort into seeing that. It, it's default. It's just right there. But God is calling us to focus on the unseen. The unseen realities of the kingdom. See, we can get so caught up in looking at the news and everything that's going on, but he has also set eternity in the human heart. We can focus on that. And we can't even comprehend what God has in store for those that love him. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Beauty comes from hoping in that. From believing and having faith in that. It comes from trusting God for that. Not just in eternity when we die, but remember, this is part of eternity. And the kingdom can come on earth as it is in heaven. We can see glimpses of it here. So that's what we hope for. That's what's beautiful. So listen, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going through in your life right now, keep your eyes on Jesus. Listen, remember the bigger reality of the eternal kingdom. This is just a, a fraction of reality. Remember, embrace, live in, see it now. See it before you're in it. And you will be living beauty. So I want to close with just one more passage and it speaks so powerfully to what we're talking about. It's probably a verse that we've all heard many times, but tune in with a new understanding right now. Holy Spirit, help us hear this. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And the next verse is one of those drop the mic moments. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Father, thank you so much for that reality check. Even though I've been spending a lot of time in these notes this week, I, I feel so emotional and moved by the truth of your word and the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. So God, make it real to us, God. Never let us fall victim to the refrigerator magnet principle where we, you know, just hear things and see things so much that it just doesn't become real. Let it be the opposite. We see it and hear it so much that it becomes our reality. This is our reality, God. So help us to comprehend, embrace the unseen. Help us to live our lives 
in and for the unseen. So, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Bless you, God. It's all for your name's sake. Your kingdom come, your will be done right here on earth and in renovate and in our lives and in our homes as it is in heaven. Forgive us, God. We fall short. Constantly, God, we fall short. So forgive us as we forgive the people who fall short of our expectations. God, give us our daily bread. Meet our needs, meet our necessities. Like the prayer of Augur, God, let us not have too much that we forget you, but let us not uh, have so little that we have to steal or something. And God, lead us not into trials and temptations. Lead us not into the sifting. Don't let us be sifted, God. But deliver us from every kind of evil. For yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.